Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone to this afternoon's webinar. Today we're delighted to welcome uh, Emma Boland, who is going to speak along with some of her colleagues about the MIT GCM User's Guide to Archer 2. Uh, Emma is happy to take questions during the talk, so either feel free to type a question into the chat or use the raise hand button at the bottom center of your screen and we can unmute you and let you ask your question. And there'll also be time for questions at the end. So welcome everyone and over to you please, Emma. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, so yes, I'm Emma Boland. For those of you who haven't met me, I'm from the British Antarctic Survey where I'm, I'm a modeler and model the ocean. I mostly use MIT GCM. Um, so this work was done in collaboration mostly by Mike Miniter, who's going to talk at the end, who is at the University of Edinburgh, but also with colleagues Danny Jones, Caitlin Naughton, and Dan Goldberg, who you'll also hear from later on. So first of all, a bit of background. Um, so this presentation is based on work that Mike did is, uh, under the project ECSC 0206, which was funded by EPCC. Um, so these are embedded CSE projects that are funded through regular calls to develop sustainable software and improve research on Archer 2. And I noticed on the mailing list today that there's currently a call out for, I think, the eighth round of funding. Um, so what it gives you is a small uh, pot of money uh, to provide funds for a research software engineer. So if you know a research software engineer at your own institute or someone you'd like to use at another institute, you can use them. Or uh, EPCC will provide you somebody from the CSE team with their appropriate skills if you don't have somebody. Um, so we use this pot of money to optimize MIT GCM on Archer 2. Um, and so this workshop is basically the outcomes of what we've learned from that little funded project, um, which was carried out by Mike. Um, sorry, the slides are very slow. So if you're interested in applying for your own little pot of money to get something working better on Archer 2, um, then you can find out more on the Archer 2 website. So on to the workshop today. Um, we'll outline getting started with MIT GCM on Archer 2. I'm going to keep this quite brief as I imagine most people who are interested in this may have used MIT GCM before. Um, and it's also all documented quite well on the Archer 2 documentation website, but I'll just give a quick overview. Um, then what we've learned from this ECSE, so tips and tricks for optimal running, how to get a cheap run versus how to get a fast run, which are not the same. Um, and then we'll go on to some advanced usage. So Caitlin's going to talk about um, if you have a long run that's going to outrun the queue, how you can chain your jobs together. I'm going to talk a little bit, a bit about adjoint models. And then Dan Goldberg is going to talk a bit about containerization for putting code that's not standard, I don't know, somehow into an extra container thing. He's going to explain it better than that, hopefully. And then finally, um, Mike Miniter is going to give a little plug for a follow on project about um, parameter optimization in climate models. So let's dive right in um, and let's look at how we get started. So all of the stuff I'm talking about and more is covered, as I said, in the Archer 2 documentation. And I wanted to point out um, that it's a collaborative document. So it's open source. It's on GitHub. So I've circled here in the top right where you can see the link to the GitHub repository. So if you come across something that's wrong on there or you come across, you run MIT TCM, you find a bug that's unique to Archer 2 and you solve it, you know, you can you can tell the community by updating the documentation yourself. And I myself have, have a few things that I need to, to do to update on here that are already that I've already found that I'm going to add. So you fork it from the GitHub repo, um, make your changes and create a pull request. And that way the documentation um, remains useful for the whole community and anything you find out doesn't just stay within your own team or your own head. Um, which I think is a really great way to do the documentation. Okay, sorry, very slow slides. Yes, I've said that already. <laughs> Come on.
Okay, so um, if you've not used Archer systems before, you might not be familiar with the home and the work directories, but the home directories are backed up, but they don't have very much space. The work directories are connected to the to the all the you know all the compute resource, but they're not backed up. So you want to install MITGCM in your home directory, and there are any all of your code changes are going to be saved. So that's my home directory. You want the best practice is to clone MITGCM from GitHub. That way you can um, keep your code up to date with any changes or even uh, create, if you make any changes yourself, you can create pull requests. So the result of this ECSE was an options file, especially for Archer 2. It's called dev Linux, whatever, but crucially it says Archer 2 at the end, so you can find it. So if you've downloaded, if you've installed MIT DCM on your machine, and you look in the tools build options file, here it is, it says Archer 2 on the end, you should be able to find it. Okay, so that's what you want to point to when you're, uh, when you're building MIT DCM in your home directory. Um, so you remember you need to specify the number of processes before you compile. Um, and then, come on slides. Sorry, the slides are very slow. I shouldn't have put so many transitions in. So then you want to go to your work directory and make your run where you're going to make your run, put on your required name lists, all your input files. And just a reminder that if you're downloading really big whole loads of input files, um, put them in a shared directory so you don't end up downloading them and then your colleague ends up downloading them too. Um, you can put there, they do have shared directories in the workspace. So within our group, for example, we share uh, input files and you can just link to them from your work directory. Um, then you're gonna copy over your executable from your home directory where you built it. It's normally called MIT GCM UV and you run it using a special Slurm script, which gives you all the options like what you're gonna call the, your job, how many nodes you're using, how, uh, how long you think it's going to run for, which queue you want to use, the standard queue or the long queue. So there's lots of examples in the Archer 2 documentation, so I'm not going to go into how to make a Slurm script, just to show you this is the kind of thing you need, but it's all there in the documentation. And then you've got your S batch, run your script and relax. And I put an exclamation mark here because we all know probably what will happen is it will crash in the first three seconds and you'll have to do some um, bug fixing. But that's in theory, <laughs> that's the workflow. Um, so how fast is Archer 2? It is very fast. So here is some data from our ECSE, our study. So these are three quite different um, MIT TCM setups. I won't go into great detail in what they are exactly because that's not so important. So PASS is a regional model of the high res regional model of the Amundsen C with interactive sea ice. Amundice has an interactive land ice model attached and is also a, a, a sector model. And then Echo V4 is a, is a global one degree model. Um, so I put on here relative run times. Um, so for test cases. So the first bar on each of those is Archer, which is one because it's all relative. And then you can see that you can get up to um, 50 to 75% speed up just on Archer 2 using the fastest runs. Um, and then the cheapest runs, which are a bit slower, um, are still a whole lot faster. <laughs> so that's good news. Archer 2 is really fast, um, which is what we were hoping for. Oh, Fraser, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, I was just wondering, uh, did you, I guess, so So when you were um, running those runs on uh, Archer and Archer 2, uh, did you change things such as the tiling configuration or was it kind of just uh, lifting the code from Archer and running it on Archer 2? So the, the fastest and the cheapest ones here are after we've optimised, so it okay. is and they so some of these do have different it's the same number of processors okay overall yeah but different numbers of cores and different um compile time options okay so 
Mike has done all the hard work. We're hoping, so the, the reason we've made our options file is that Mike's tried all the different compile time options and you yeah. see what's in the options files, what seems to run the fastest for, for our, admittedly just for our use cases, but they're quite varied. Um, if you've got a very particular use case, then you might want to, you, you know, and it's, you know, you really want to optimize it. You could play with the, those compile time options yourself, but I think, Mike's done most of that. So the next thing is to say, what's a fast run and what's a cheap run? So again, this is mostly from, oh, slow slides. Um, this is mostly based on these three use cases. So it might vary depending on your individual case, but basically the rule is uh, faster is with more nodes. So if you split your, even if you're not fully utilizing each node, you can split up, you can split up your um, cores off to over more nodes. It generally gets faster, but you do get diminishing returns. So splitting it up over two nodes does, isn't twice as fast, it's, but it is faster. Um, and you're, so, and the more nodes you go to, the less relative speed up you're getting. And then the cheapest runs, come on we're always with the fewest nodes. So if you, the fewest nodes you can fit your um, run on, that will give you the, le that's the cheapest runtime because you're not requiring the resource, uh, more resource than you need really. So if you're worried about your CPU budget, use the fewest nodes. If you just want to fit into the, your queue time, or you just need to get that run finished, then more nodes will work. And like, yes, as I said before, the options file we've provided that's in the MIT GCM repository is optimized for the test cases we hear. If you're, you know, if you have a very complicated, unique setup, it might be worth experimenting with the run, the compile time options. Um, let's see. Come up slides. Okay. So Finally, we use find the create compiler the most reliable, but some of our use cases needed the GNU G4 Tran options file. So we have one of those available. If anyone finds that they need that, um, just get in contact. Um, so things that we didn't have time to answer or weren't funded to answer um, is, is in out efficiency. So we've looked at runtime efficiency. Um, but we haven't, didn't have a time to look at IO efficiency. There is a whole page on Archer 2 documentation that talks about um, different things like striping and all sorts. Um, and there are, there is different ways of asking MIT DCM to either write to one file or write to multiple files per, so one file per CPU or one file, one file that all the CPUs write to. So. There's a little section called Achieving Efficient I.O. And that's something I'm going to be exploring myself um, in the next few weeks. But um, if anybody finds some ways of making that faster for MIT GCM, that's also something that I'd be interested in uh, learning about. So drop us a message. Yes, please share with the community. <laughs> um, and I think that might be, yes, we're moving on to advanced usage now. So the first um, bit of advanced usage is job chaining. So I'm going to stop talking and let Caitlin take over here. Hello, everybody. You can hear me okay? You should if you can't hear me, I guess. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin. I'm an ocean modeler in the British Antarctic Survey. I'm one of Emma's colleagues, and I, he, I'm here to talk about a very long simulations, which you might want to do with MIT GCM. You might want to run 10 years, you might oh, I want to run 100 years, and you won't be, be able to finish that uh, during the uh, the maximum wall time of the key, which is usually 24 hours. Uh, so MIT GCM allows you to stop and restart um, for, from a <laughs> pick up files at any uh, frequency so you want to write those. So the, uh, the workflow is you, you run MIDGCM, you stop, you edit the, the name list to tell it where to restart, and then you resubmit the same job to run it again, and you go back to the beginning and you repeat. Uh, the big question is 
where do you break it up? Uh, wh wh where do you decide to do the stop and restarts? And uh, the w w way everyone used to do this is to run a set for the length of simulations to say a year. So you run a year, you stop, you, e you edit the, the name list, you resubmit the job, you wait in the queue and you repeat. Uh, the problem is that, that the length of time it takes to simulate one year um, slightly varies, and so, so you'll want to uh, to, uh, to overestimate uh, this wall time to make sure that you, you don't end up r r running out of time, and then the whole chain breaks, and you have to to manually restart instead of enjoying your weekend. Um, and this stopping and restarting frequently also means that you, you spend proportionally more time on mo mo model initialization, which isn't as e efficient. And also, you, you're waiting in the queue several times a day, for example, so there's m m more opportunity to hit a bottle n n neck in the queue. So what, what uh, we've designed as part of this project and what um, Mike has implemented on, on Archer 2 is a, um, a new strategy, which is to, uh, to request as much wall time as you can get, so 24 hours. You run at MIT GCM for, for as long as you possibly can. And then a few minutes before the end, um, the job submission script forces the simulation to stop in the middle, and that's using a utility called timeout. And then it looks at the pickup files to f figure out which is the most recent uh, pick up and edits the, the, the name list to tell it where to restart and it resubmits. So this makes sure that you are queuing as few times as possible and it also reduces the guesswork for the user because you don't have to test how long it um, takes for your configuration to run a particular chunk of time. Uh, next slide it isn't coming up now. There it is. Uh, so all the code for this is a uh, publicly available. I'll uh, um, I'll stick the link in the chat when I'm finished speaking. Uh, there's a few different files you want to grab if you're interested in doing this yourself, and they all go into your scripts directory. Uh, so to get the chain started, you don't have to submit uh, the job yourself. Instead, you just r run a script called a sub run, and th that script it's, itself submits the job, which starts off the, uh, 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 the chain. Uh, and there's actually two jobs uh, which run in the chain. Run repeat actually runs MIT GCM edits the, the name of the list just like uh, we talked about. Um, but then that calls a second job on the serial queue, uh, which uh, converts the binary output uh, to to net CDF and uh, and optionally um, art syncs it to another s server. If you don't care about doing than that, you can easily edit the code to skip it. Uh, but, but that's the way it's written is there's these uh, two scripts which call each other repeatedly until your simulation is all done. And I think th that's it, unless there's any questions about this, um, about the job training. Thanks very much, Caitlin. Um, so the next part of the advanced usage is our joint models. Oh, Fraser has a question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry, uh, this is a quick question about the job chaining. Is that stuff on the Archer 2 documentation at the moment? Or, and is there a plan to put it on there? Um, I don't 
believe so. I think it was M M Mike who was a uh, li li liaising with documentation. Do you know about this, Mike? Uh, it's specific to the pass case, you know, so that uh, it's not part of generic um, MIT GCM documentation. Okay, okay, yes, so, so, so you'd have to slightly yeah, adapt it for your yeah, own I'm use. I'm actually not quite sure how much of the um, things like edits to the name lists are specific to your uh, PAS case and how much is generic, I must confess. Um, you know, but the uh, software that we use for this is in the um, PASS um, okay. GitHub. Yeah, no, yeah. this, this, or I, I've done a bit of job training with MIT GCM, and this sounds like it'd work quite well for the kind of stuff which I've been doing, which is, uh, I think, by the sounds of it, quite different. So, yeah, I guess it, it seems like it'd be useful to be, I think it, it might be generic enough to be on there. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, um, it sh shouldn't depend uh, speci yeah. uh, specifically on this configuration, but, but yes, this is the, uh, the only co uh, configuration we've tested it. Um, yeah. I I'd be happy to look at it with you if, uh, you know, for a, have a Zoom call for an hour and uh, look at it with you if that was helpful at any point. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Or if Caitlin didn't, want, didn't have the time to do it herself because obviously she can. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you. No, that, it, it sounds uh, it sounds like there's some sort of useful principles there anyway, which could, which are broadly applicable. So. Great. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, I can also see that Claire's linked to some parts of the R2 documentation that have job ch chaining stuff on there. So it might be that it might be useful at some point to add a little section if there's stuff on there that isn't covered. Stuff that you guys have developed that isn't covered there that might be useful. But yes. OK, great. Um, so adjoint modeling. What is an adjoint model? <laughs> Um, so in a traditionally traditional sensitivity experiment of a of a climate model, you would perturb um, something and then run your model forward to see what happens. Adjoints run the question in reverse. You start by uh, thinking of your quantity of interest. So that's what what you're interested in studying. So in our case, it's often say the heat content of a bit of the ocean, which exists at some point in time and space in the model. Your adjoint sensitivity experiment runs model forwards to calculate this quantity of interest and then backwards um, to calculate basically partial derivatives of this. So sensitivities of that to um, forcings of the model or even other fields within the model or parameters within the model. So here in, the, in the, this example, you can see it's working at net, the sensitivity to net heat flux and to wind stress. Um, and, but you don't get this at just one point in space or time, you, get this, you can get this at as many snapshots as you want going back in time to the start of the model and their global fields. So you get a kind of map of sensitivity. So that's really nice. Um, there's currently two options for uh, adjointing your model automatically. Um, there's OpenAD, which is great because it's open source. However, it's harder to use off the shelf. As far as I could tell, the website hadn't been updated for some time, 20, maybe 24 or a long time ago. Um, so uh, I know Dan Goldberg will talk about using that later. What I have more experience with is a piece of software called TAF, which is created by a German company called FastOpt. So this does require a license, so you'll need funding to pay for it, but it seems to work much more reliably um, and it's integrated into the creation of the Echo V4 state estimate. So the Echo V4 state estimate um, uses um, an adjoint model to optimize itself. So it's a state estimate um, which uh, the state estimate is arrived at by running MIT GCM multiple times using uh, by being forced by observations initially, and then uh, at the end of that. The first one, you look at the model data misfit, so the model observation misfit, and you use that as your quantity of interest. So your quantity of interest is the um, model observation difference. You create an, you ask your adjoint model what that difference is sensitive to um, in the initial conditions and the forcing fields, and so and then you change those and then you rerun and see if your model 
your model observation difference gets smaller and then there is sensitivities are different. So you run that several times in the latest release, they run it 129 times until they basically, you know, you arrive, um, you converge on a solution, which is the state estimate. So you can use the, um, the, the adjoint mode if you want to do adjoint modeling studies there is a section of the documentation, RH2 documentation, about exactly this. So I'm not going to talk over in too detail, but just to give you a high level overview, instead of when you're making, when you're compiling your MIT DCM code, instead of make all you do these two different adjoint um, statements and then great, generate your adjoint code. And so you, instead of MIT GCM UV as an executable, you have MIT GCM UV underscore AD. Um, you need to turn on the echo package to calculate your cost function or your quantity of interest. And you need to turn on the control package to generate the sensitivities. Um, you follow, define your quantity of interest in data dot echo following the MIT GCM documentation. So here's a table that I've taken from the documentation that just shows you the kind of easy cost functions or quantity of interest you can do right out of the shelf it's right over the shelf so you can calculate the mean of theta over a box or the salt over a box or sea surface height or volume trucks transport through a section very easily all you have to do is provide um, a mask that says where in space and time you want this to be applied um, and there that there you've defined your cost function you can also do much more complicated things if you want to um, and then the control package will um, determine what sensitivities are calculated. Um, so everything is documented on this in section 10 of the MIT DCM documentation. There's a, de a dedicated echo mailing list. It's a kind of sub MIT DCM mailing list that can help with all kinds of adjoint problems. Um, and you can find out more about at the echo group website. Um, because a lots of people use the adjoint model to do all sorts of things not just the state estimate. Okay, so is Dan Goldberg in the room? He is, hooray. <laughs> Hi Dan, um, do you want to take over now and we can talk about containerization? Yeah, um, hang on. Emma asked me to talk about um, containerization, which is something I had never, I, I basically only vaguely heard of it before um, beginning work on this ECSC project, and I definitely didn't know what it was used for and what it would be, how to use it and what it would be useful for. And so I have to say, like, it opened up new doors to me um, by being sort of like, by being part of this project. Um, and it just, I'll just talk about, um, I, I'm not, in, you know, I'm not the type of person who can tell you exactly what a container is and how it is implemented and how it works, uh, because I'm I'm not coming from that sort of I'm not coming from that area. Uh, it's just from a really a user perspective of singularity containers. Um, I you know tried to do a bit of reading up on what a container is and how to best explain it, but we'll, we'll see. Um, there might be people moderators who know about, a lot more about it than me. Um, and I'll just do three use cases. Um, the first one of which was basically in order to, you know, achieve to, to make to do to achieve the deliverables of the ECSC project, but I found it useful for other things as a result of learning it um, during ECSC. And I'll, I'll talk about those too. So my understanding of what a container is and how I would explain it to someone is it's not a virtual machine. A virtual machine virtualizes the hardware, the actual CPUs and the registers, whereas, and I think even the storage, whereas containers, they virtualize the operating system, but interact with the hardware, the physical hardware, and the physical file server. So why would we do that? Well, you might not have root privileges on the machine you're using, and you don't, and that, you know, the system administrators might be too busy, might be way too busy to install um, a piece of software exactly the way you like it. So that's a reason to use a container. Um, you might not know how to install software in the target environment, even if you know to, how to do so on a sort of like more vanilla 
um, operating system. So that would be an application of it. The target environment may not have the libraries that you need, and it might be difficult to install them on the native machine, so a container is useful for that. And also for reproducibility, taking a, mo a complicated model, running it on one you know, um, HPC framework, it, you, won't, you probably won't get the result, the same results exactly as you do on another, but um, through a container, I, I, I believe you can, you can do so. You, you can at least standardize the operating system that you're using, even if not the, the hardware. Um, so this might sound, some of you might have you know, come across Docker or might have used Docker. And I think they are similar. And from what I've been able to find, as in, I don't know the inner workings of each and how they're different. But um, what I've been able to find out is that a singularity image, because that's what you get when you're using um, containers, you get sort of an image of an operating system. Um, a singularity image is a file which can just be moved, you can email it, you can, you can FTP it, you can move it around from place to place. While Docker images are a bit more complicated, I think you, you can never, it's, it's really difficult to find where a Docker image is hidden on your, in your file system or on your machine once you install Docker. But I think they, you know, they, they kind of fulfill similar roles, but from what I understand, this is more anecdotal, but Singularity is supposedly closer to the hardware, so it might yield better performance. And Singularity is, this is something that I came across a lot, Singularity is more secure than Docker. And so I guess in a world where kind of all the HPC, like national capability HPC system, systems across Europe were hijacked two years ago to produce Bitcoin, you can imagine which you know, version, which of these uh, options people would be more comfortable using. But Docker is more mature, and so there's uh, with better documentation and support. So you can find more kind of help pages on how to do things with Docker than with Singularity. Singularity cannot yet be installed on Mac, I don't think, or Windows. So you're kind of uh, limited to to using it on Linux. Um, so the use case, the the one that was relevant to ECSE, um, the one that 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 Emma led. Uh, had to do with OpenAD. Uh, Emma just introduced OpenAD. It is an open source um, source transformation AD tool, as in you take your complicated model, pass it through this software, which is almost like a compiler, but instead of getting machine code, you get new code. And that code compiles into an adjuvant model, which can give you these sensitivities that are so great to have. Um, it has been applied to MIT TCM, but as Emma said, not used as extensively. But it's free. I mean, Emma didn't say the cost, but TAF is like, it's like 11,000 euros per year. And if you're sort of like collaborating with people at a different institution, they have to pay that same fee on top of it. And there's sort of, it's not really negotiable. So in a lot of cases, you know, the, the use of TAF is limited to people who have a lot of money um, to sort of um, spend on it year after year. So that's why open source tools are good. But um, as the reason that support was kind of frozen after 2014 is that it's no longer being supported by Argonne National Lab. They're no longer the person who was working on it the most left and went to industry. And so it's a bit frozen and um, well, that, that kind of bears on something later. But ad the adjuvant performance is not great for reasons that I, I, I've never quite understood. I think there's a few reasons why it is, but I don't think anyone's ever looked into it. But you know, it's it's you, you compile an adjoint with um, with OpenAD, it's going to be about three to four times slower than it is with TAF, and that's true for the ocean model. It's not with Streamice, which is a nice model, a sort of um, a continental ice sheet model written as a package within MIT GCM. It's not really extensively used. Is you know people use bicycles or UA, uh, people don't use Streamice so much. But Streamice was written with with the goal in mind of having um, an, an adjointable ice sheet model that can do the same thing as, as is done with the ocean mo model for ECHO. And it's still the only one, only thing that does that. And so in order to have that, in order to not pay the, the, the fees for TAB, <clears throat> we do need um, OpenAD. And the issue, because it was frozen, is that the binaries can't be compiled 
OpenAD is you know, sort of a set of executables that you need to build on your own machine or your, your own hardware and or whatever um, sort of system you're using. And it doesn't seem to compile with GCC of 5.x or later. It's kind of stuck in 4.9.2 or something like that. And I just want to point out that, that, that that's not limiting. This isn't a limitation of it that of MIT GCM itself or the code that you get from passing it through OpenAD, but it's the actual executable itself that does that transformation that needs to be built as well. It needs to be built with ancient um, libraries. And the Archer 2 administrators were, well, we kind of asked them to in install an old version of GCC and they said no, and they recommended a singularity instead. And it took me a while to get my head around what that actually meant, but once I did, um, it was a tremendous help. So the strategy that was used here, and it could be done for other sort of libraries that need things that aren't necessarily on Archer 2. Um, the strategy was to compile open AD execu executables within a singularity container, which produces what's called a .sif file, singularity image file. Um, so that requires just to say what it's what it needs, it require it does require an installation of Singularity on a like my home computer, which was just it was just a computer that I used in my department, a Linux machine, along with a definition file, and also user group permissions. You basically need root access to create an to create a Singularity container, which kind of takes away the advantage of not needing root access. But it turns out that you know, the system administrator can give you sort of like can can add you to a group that gives you root access only for the purpose of creating singularity files and nothing else. And so that's what was done. And then I just FTP'd it to Archer 2 and was able to where, you know, singularity is also install, installed. I doubt I can I could Def, like create a singularity image on Archer 2, but I can definitely send it there from my home computer and then use it. And the way in which I use it is to not, um, you know, compile MIT GCM or it's that joint in a container, but just during the compilation process at points where source needs to be transformed from for the Ford model to adjoint code, that's where um, calls to this to open AD are made, and those are made within a container. So in the end, I'm not going to need a, I don't, I'm not going to need to run MIT GCM in a container, but something that's compiled in, in a container, open AD, then needs to be run in a container. But that, you know, what that it, it, I'm getting very meta here. That involves that's that's part of the compilation of MIT GCM, not the run. And the resources that I used. Some of them are provided in a webinar, in an Archer 2 training course. And I think that this is really helpful. So I gave this link here. It's really helpful in kind of understanding even what Singularity was. I mean, to even get my head around what it, what it, what it was and the fact that an image could be created using a def file, that's what this taught me. It didn't tell me how to write a more complex def file and so from that, 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 this link here provided by uh, Scilabs, who creates Singularity, I, I, I think, um, they provide a bit of a more in-depth guide into how, create it, how to create a definition file for a container. And uh, finally, there's um, the, the definition file that I wrote was actually adopted by the sort of like the lead developers of MIT GCM, and it kind of made its way into um, into the documentation of the official documentation of MIT GCM. So if you're interested, that's right here. And uh, I don't think, I don't know if it was discussed in the beginning, but there's a sort of build process. There's a lot of scripts, um, make uh, scripts that we use to generate make files and to, and to, and to build at MIT GCM. And um, the sort of the way in which Singularity or OpenAD executables are invoked with singularity is kind of buried within this file, which is called genmake2. So it does kind of just, just to give you a feel for what you're doing when you use, when you run something in a singularity container, you're, you're just, you just preface it with, with singularity exec, 
and then and then do the command just as you would do without a container. So that's what's sort of like in this in this line here. Without singularity without being singularity being used, it would just be the rest of this line. That's something that takes place in the compilation by sort of invoking the, the open AT executables. And I just want to say, I don't know if anyone here um, is at University of Edinburgh and has come across Dr. Magnus Hagdorn before. He was research software engineer in geosciences in Edinburgh. He's not there anymore. But he was also, by, by sort of giving me a template of, of a really advanced build in Singularity, that's how I was able to, to learn how to do it and to adapt it for OpenAD. Um, and then just to say, we, you know, we used, I used this to do a little bit of um, science with it. So it, it, at, the, at the end, you want to be able to, to actually do science with these things, with these tools that you create through these ECSE um, projects, and, and that was done. So that was nice. Um, just very quickly, and I'm happy to be cut off because I just uh, there's I'm done with the ECSC part. But I said there were some other use cases. Ba basically, I got excited because oh now I no longer need root privileges to do what I want. So something that was kind of a bugbear with me was that you know I like to run um, when I'm running running a long simulation on on an HPC machine. I like to be able to, you know, print out the diagnostic to visualize the diagnostics files every once in a while before the the the, the run is done, and um, you know I can't use MATLAB, I can use Python, but what I found on Archer two, which wasn't the case on Archer, was that I couldn't um, I could maybe there's a way, but I couldn't figure out how to display interactive figures um, over X11 over using X11 forwarding. With Archer 2. It seems to that when I use the matplotlib library to sort of like update the you know the sort of like output of the figures, I couldn't seem to adjust it so I could see them sort of in real time. I had to save the figure to a file and then I had to FTP it back to my home to, to my local computer. But I wanted to just use display and, the, and display is not there so I wrapped display a very sort of really basic um, utility within a container and now I use that and I can view images that I that I create on Archer 2 without having to FTP them back to my, my home sort of institution. Uh, another use case is that some something that would annoy me for a while was that I have a rack server. There's a lot of rack servers within my school with like multiple cores and they have some of them do have open MPI installations on them, but they don't seem to be quite the environment is just not quite what the MIT GCM build script is expecting. And I think if I was very, very clever, I could configure the options of, of the sort of make file generation of MIT GCM to adapt to the local environment. But the other option is to make a new environment that's more standard with singularity. So that's what I've done. And this is, I guess this is the first example that I've shown of actually running something that was um, in parallel with MPI, MPI run, that was created in a container. And so I show how, you know, these top, these first three commands here, I've got this environment that, it, that I want to compile, in which I want to compile MIT GCM. So I do so using these three commands, um, which anyone who uses MIT GCM is used to, the gen make to command to create the make file, then the make depend, which brings in all the sort of dependent um, software uh, source files, and then make. But it's always prefaced by the singularity exec, and then this dash b, because you need to basically, if you're not sort of using singularity in your in the sh in the share that in the file server that host that has your own home directory, then you basically need to um, mount it. But that, that's no problem as long as you know the command to do it. Uh, so once that's done, I can then run Singularity. I can run MIT GCM with 24 CPUs using Singularity. One thing that I came across is any, all the help pages that I, can, that I sort of consulted, they say run Singularity in MIP, with MIP, it, with, sort of invoke Singularity with MIP, MPI run. So that's this first option here, MPI run dash N24 sort of invokes 24 instances of 24 processes 
that are all connected, communicating with each other, but all those processes sort of then run sing like invoke the singularity to open this container to run MIT GCM. But I found that I could reverse that. I could sort of have a singular, single instance of, singul instance of singularity, then invoking MPI run within the container. I'm not sure. This is this was odd to me because they they both had this similar performance. So I I didn't know that you could do this, but it turns out that I think you might be able to. And the catch, at least what I've read, is that you need a native. In, I, I've not tested this, but it all the all the help pages, all the all the stuff I found online says that you do need a native installation of MPI and that the image, the installation of MPI within the image must be consistent in some way that I, I'm not got my head around with, with the, um, with the physical MPI installation. So if you have like MPI CH in your, uh, on your machine, then you need to have MPI CH on your container. I don't know if it goes beyond that. And I don't know if, um, this rule of thumb here is sort of like upended by this manner of using singularity. Um, uh, so I'm not sure, but that that's that's all that I have to say. And thank you for giving me so much time. Thank you, Dan. Um, I'm going to go back to the slides. Oops, and. We'll move on to the last, very last thing is a little uh, message from Mike on his latest project, um, which people might find interesting. Okay. Um, Mike, take it away. You should be able to move the slides forward. Um, just thank you. Um, so uh, another project I had uh, is my sound okay, please, Emma? Emma yes, my sound I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, had problems with it earlier. Uh, so another ECSE project was to port software called OptClim to Archer in, able, in order to be able to optimize models. So as with MIT GCM, many models have parameters set in name lists. And the idea was to be able to tune parameters, values against observation um, use, and using OptClim to do that. So um, what we do is define, if we um, start top left, then we begin um, an OptClim study by defining values of parameters you know, for a certain set of um, uh, physical processes um, using those parameters, maybe within a range, but not knowing exactly what value is best. So begin with starting values of parameters, run the models, generate um, some simulated observations, compare them with the actual observations. So if we were doing a climate um, run, climate model, then it would be things like outgoing short wave and long wave radiation. You know, so that we derive skill scores by comparing the simulated results with the uh, observed data, run an optimization algorithm and then redefine sets of parameters and go around that loop. You know, so that's something that um, you know, we have running and we have it running with um, uh, MIT GCM based models with the climate model CESM and with the UK ESM models. And I really just wanted to flag that we've done that. And if anyone was interested to find out more, then please email me. And um, thank you for the chance to mention this. No worries. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, so that I think we've come to the end of all of our content. If anyone else has any more questions, or I'll just mean to thank Mike for all his hard work on this project as well as all the other collaborators. Okay, I think we're done. <laughs> oh, Fraser. Sorry, uh, I think the, the hand raise was slightly delayed there. Um, I had uh, just sort of two uh, more questions. Um, yeah, go one, for it. Uh, one was, um, did you have a look at sort of uh, the optimal tile sizes uh, when you were sort of uh, looking at the optimizations? And were, did you, if you did, did you kind of get out any 
I guess, kind of principles for choosing um, optimal uh, tile configurations. Um, and I guess the second question uh, was slightly related. Did you have a look at um, when you, I guess, in your job submission script when you run S run? Uh, I think there's like some slurm options which let you uh, sort of um, select different processor placement uh, algorithms. And I was wondering if you looked at uh, those as well and which of those were best. Um, uh, great. Um, so with the tile sizes, uh, we used, we found that the best was to use every core on a node, you know, so that yep. uh, arrange tile sizes so that uh, uh, you know, they were um, easily, um, that the decomposition worked across um, 120 per node. Is that um, the right answer? Is that the, am I answering your question on the first one? Um, well, I guess I was wondering more in terms of, so uh, do you want sort of very rect, uh, do you want uh, tiles which are sort of an equal size in the X and Y direction? Did you find that those might have worked ah. sort of faster or did they want to be more rectangular or, um, yeah, uh, and I guess what's, what sort of number, what's, yeah, what sort of number of grid points per tile were, were working well for you? We didn't explore oh, different shapes of tiles. Okay. Cool. No, that's that's and fine. Then on the S run, um, yes, I'm glad you mentioned that because um, uh, especially Echo made um, a difference uh, as to whether you use things like block block or block cyclic, you know, to do with how you allocate processes. Um, to a node and within a node. And yep. um, uh, I found that with echo, um, a cyclic cyclic was faster than block block. Okay. The logic for this, I think, comes from the strange, um, well, if you think um, a rectangular grid is normal, then uh, Echo has a, has a different kind of grid with different sorts of interfaces between um, uh, the subgrids. Uh, you know, the yep. shape of the uh, grid is, um, I've forgotten the word, forgive me, someone help me out. Um, it, no, but it means that uh, cyclic cyclic proves to be more efficient. What okay. I it's it's tiled, to... it's got like, it's like a five-sided cube. Thank you. Cube, yeah, cube sphere. Yeah, I think there is scope for doing one more thing, which um, I was thinking over the last few days, I'm sorry I didn't have time to do, which is to do a little bit of um, profiling and then uh, see whether you can force uh, a different kind of mapping. And I think Perf Tools allows that profiling to be done. And I think where you have um, you know, that kind of non-simple rectangular grid, it might be worth trying that, uh, you know, but so the short answer is I tried with cyclic cyclic and it was faster with echo. I don't think it made any difference with um, the um, pass. And um, I think that there's a further check. It would be I'm hoping to yet to have the chance to do if we can find a bit of spare time, you know, to look at a more subtle remapping of processes to cause. Okay, nice, thank you. No, that, that, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. Just to mention on that, additionally to Perf Tools, there's um, Armforge Map now on Archer 2, which might be useful to look into this. Oh, um, sorry, I heard a disembodied voice, but I wasn't sure where it came from. Hi, this, sorry, this is James Richings. I'm one of the moderators for this session. I was just going to ah. mention that we've had, the last two weeks, we've had uh, talks from someone from Armforge um, giving some tutorials on their map profiler and their debugger. So that's another tool that's available for profiling work Ooh. on the Archer 2, if it's useful to you. Thank you. Are there any more questions? If not, I'd like to extend our thanks to Emma and also to Caitlin and to Mike and to Dan for um, an excellent presentation. and. Um, Thank you to everyone for attending.
Thank you very much. Thank Bye. You.